Welcome to another episode of Money You Should Ask, where everyone has something they can teach you. I'm your host, Bob Wheeler. In this episode, we are going to explore why we do what we do when it comes to money. As a CPA for the past 30 years, wait, let me say 25 because that makes me sound younger. I have seen it all when it comes to money and emotions. And if you think I'm talking about my clients, I'm not. I'm talking about myself. My relationship with money has been, and sometimes still is, an emotional roller coaster. Maybe that's something you're also familiar with. Good news. You and I are not the only ones. Our next guest is going to share their money beliefs, money blocks, and life challenges as well. Buckle your seatbelt and enjoy the ride. Our next guest is Brett Swartz. Brett is the founder of Capital Gains Tax Solutions. His company helps people escape feeling trapped by capital gains tax with his deferred sales trusts. His experience includes numerous deferred sales trusts, 1031 exchanges, and 88 million in closed commercial real estate brokerage transactions. He's an active commercial real estate broker and investor with brokerage experience and ownership in multifamily, senior housing, retail, medical office, and mixed-use properties. He's a licensed real estate broker who holds Series 22 and 63 licenses. He has also created and hosts a podcast, Capital Gains Tax Solution. Brett, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, Brett, I got to ask, how did you get started with helping people with capital gains tax? Was that something like as a five-year-old, you said, man, I want to help people avoid tax? No, it's not. I fell in love with real estate at a young age as a five-year-old. I fell in love with building wealth throughout my teenage years and had a chance to go to college and study business, Bible and theology, and got a minor in counseling psychology, as well took an internship at a place called Marcus and Millichap, where I fell in love with underwriting, cash flow, multifamily brokerage on a bigger scale. And so I was helping people buy and sell, do 1031 exchanges. And that was my first introduction to tax deferral and the power of using, you know, pre-tax dollars to grow wealth and to do that in a compounding way over time. But it wasn't always that way. You know, 2005, 6, 7, all of a sudden something happened in 08. There was a crash in the marketplace. And when that happened, it changed my perspective on what tools were actually available. And also thinking outside of the traditional, I call it Blockbuster 1031 box and looking at more of like the Netflix type of deferred sales trust exit planning for clients so they can create and preserve more wealth and never have to feel trapped by capital gains tax ever again. And really the story is the marketplace fell apart and we had clients, friends and family lose half or everything within a couple of years. And the thing we could identify was the overpaying of the 1031 exchange properties here in Northern California. And we couldn't help but figure out what went wrong, what we could do better. And that's when we learned about the Deferred Sales Trust. And I learned about it for the first time. And I started to apply it to clients, to solving problems. Because I always say, Bob, we're not in the business of selling real estate or tax deferral. We're actually just in the business of solving problems. And if you can help enough people solve their problems, your business tends to grow. And so that began the journey of rolling this out, educating multifamily owners in Sacramento. And that has grown to a national, we do cryptocurrency, businesses, primary homes, of course, commercial real estate transactions, save, fail, 1031 exchanges. And it's it's a lot of fun because not a lot of people know about it. That sounds really cool. And I would imagine the studying psychology gives you a little edge up than other people because business for me is relationships. And like you said, it's about actually solving problems versus, oh, we're going to do this exactly. It's solving problems. That's why people come to you because they don't know how to solve them. Now, I have a question, Brett. The 1031 for people that don't know is basically this way of deferring the capital gains on one property and moving it into another property. My question to you, because there has been talk about this and I won't hold you to it, but there's talk about the 1031 going away. And if that 1031 goes away, they'll still be able to use the tools that you have. What are your thoughts on the 1031 and its place in the tax code? Well, I think as real estate entrepreneurs or real estate owners or investors or brokers, we, we all hope that the 1031 does stay. And it does look like, by the way, the latest I've heard that what was proposed to take away is now off the table or mostly off the table. So that's good news for all of us who love investment real estate and and deferring tax and doing more and more deals. However, the 1031 exchange can also be very frustrating. And I actually just did a poll. I spoke at a conference last week 
And I asked, what's the biggest frustration with the 1031 exchange? And it was interesting to see the answers. And some of the top ones was the shotgun 45-day uh, engagement, 180-day wedding, right? You got to get married, engaged and wedding quick. And we all have friends and family who got engaged and, and maybe married too quickly, right? And that's part of what this 1031 challenge or shotgun wedding creates is pressure situation where you're selling high and buying higher 180 days later. And our parents taught us to do the opposite. Bob told us to sell high and buy low, right? And too often, especially right now in today's real estate environment, there's low inventory, very high prices, and lots of money chasing very few deals that make a lot of sense. And so I love a 1031 when there's a forced value add appreciation opportunity where you can go in and buy something on its cash on cash initial return, as well as a chance to grow the rents through forced appreciation opportunities. That's fantastic. But the challenge with the 1031 is those are hard to find. Number two, your old depreciation schedule travels, which is also a challenge that because one of the number one ways to own real estate is for the depreciation to offset the income from the property and potentially even your own income if you can become what's called a, a real estate professional, okay? So, and using something called cost segregation. The other thing with the 1031 is you can't diversify. You're typically selling one asset, moving it into one other asset, right? In other words, you can't go into stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you can't go into hard money lending, a new business venture, cryptocurrency. You can't dollar cost average. You're doing it all in one single six month period of time. We like to call that blockbusters, like going on a Friday night, Bob, you had that movie you wanted to get at the end of the aisle. It's behind that cardboard box, but somebody grabs it right before you can grab it. Even if you got that movie, you have to return within three days. And if you didn't rewind it, or if you returned it after that time, you have a penalty. That's like the 1031. It's very restrictive. It doesn't work for things like cryptocurrency, like the deferred sales trust is. We just helped a client who exited $50,000 of Bitcoin. It went up to 50 million. And so she had a large gain. Well, a 1031, you cannot do that, but you can deferred sales trust that. And so a 5 million of that 50 was moved into the trust, of which tax deferred, she was able to start a business of her dreams, retire from her W-2 big tech job, and now have freedom to do what she wants. And part of that was because of the tax she was able to defer, which is over a million and a half dollars. And so that's the main thing. It works for all assets. We did a primary home sale in Palo Alto for 8.3 million. Did a dentist sale just in New Jersey just uh, last week for 1.4 million. They worked for 30 years. They have no basis. They're about to pay $600,000 of this $1.4 million business sale. But instead of having to give it all the way to charity or not having a 1031, they did a deferred sales trust. Now they're working with a financial advisor, which is a partner of ours, and they're investing the money to make sense of it. So those are some of the reasons why you, you would consider the deferred sales trust versus the 1031. And I love, Brett, that people are coming to you and asking questions. Here's the important thing. You got to ask the questions before you do the transaction. I just had a client in my office sold a $3 million property and they said, hey, we want to do a 1031. Escrow closes in five days. <laughs> that ship has sort of sailed, <laughs> right? And talking about 1031s or talking about tax strategies after the fact are just not as effective as actually figuring out the solutions ahead of time. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you got you to make sure you're planning the exit plan before you're exiting the asset, right? So we always say underwrite the exit plan first before you have someone underwrite your property or asset that you're going to be selling and selling. So they're two separate things. And, and it's like in a Rubik's Cube, right? I mean, you have all the different colors on different sides and different people have different challenges with different things. And the goal is to, to hire the who, don't be the how. Go with trusted professionals who can help make the colors of all the part of your cube that's complicated as congruent as possible. And part of that is doing it prior to. So the deferred sales trust does need to be set up prior to unless it's in a 1031 exchange. We can save a failed 1031 exchange. So that's a nice bonus here without having to identify the DST, without past your 45 days. You need to make sure you're working with a qualified intermediary that will cooperate, just so you know. But yeah, we do those a lot. But if it's a business sale or cryptocurrency or public or private stock or artwork collectibles, we need to have it in the contract prior to the, even the buyer removing all contingencies, okay? And there's a thing called constructive receipt, which basically means if you've gone too far down a deal and you're going to basically receive the funds here shortly, nothing's really holding you back from receiving it except for closing, then it's taxable. But if we can set up the trust prior to, we can get everything lined up properly. And that's also important because you want to make sure you have a plan for your money. Because if you don't have a plan for your money, someone else does, right? The government definitely he doesn't have a great plan for it. They're going to spend it pretty quickly. And so we just want, we, that's part of why we work with financial advisors, CPAs, tax attorneys. My role as a trustee, Capital Gains Tax Solutions, to make sure that this all goes as smooth as possible and we have a great plan in place. Now, speaking of plans, 
you are invested in all kinds of real estate. You've got multifamily, you've got commercial, you've got senior housing. Why is that important? You know, I'm thinking, did that happen in 2008 that you had a shift? Did you decide to diversify into different type of real estate when you were younger? You know, if somebody told me five years ago about commercial, I would have said, there's no way that commercial buildings would ever be sitting empty. And yet today, commercial may not, for some people, be the best investment just because of world events. How did you decide on your plan and what motivated that? Yeah, great question. So first of all, I was fortunate enough to not have as much money prior to 2008. I was just in college, just graduating, just getting my life started. And so I had a lot of friends that graduated a couple of years prior to me, and uh, they got caught with that big mortgage and that big debt and had to foreclose on their house, right? And all of those things. So it was kind of just, to me, a blessing that it took us a little while to get going in the business. And then when we did have the opportunity, A, we bought our first house, right? And then we renovated that, and then we moved that into another and took some of the capital there and we invested in some property. B, as I would do deals as a broker, we'd also delay gratification and that we would roll sometimes the fees into the property and become a small sliver in a big property, right? And then C, as I did deals with clients as well, I'd say, oh my gosh, they're doing it right. They're not doing it as well. Let me go partner with those that do. Like the same thing with hiring the who, not being the how on investment strategies, tax strategies, and different things like that. We try to find the best track record and experts in that expertise of a property. So we just did a $7.3 million property in Elk Grove, California. I represented the buyer client of mine, senior housing, memory care, independent living, right? That's what they do. And I was so just impressed by them, their team, their culture, their performance, their track record, their organization that I said, I raised my hand. I said, hey, can myself and my dad invest in with you, right? And we did. And so it's more so making sure that you believe in the sponsor and you believe in the property. As that happens, it's not so much that I was looking for medical office, but oh my gosh, the opportunity came up at a good time in the marketplace, next to a hospital. We thought we could get Kaiser to potentially lease out some of the medical office space and the, the walkability of the property and the asset. This is downtown Sacramento, East Sacramento. And so it happened to be medical office. And then the sponsor happened to be my mentor and cousin and one of my best friends. That worked out. So it's just these little small pieces slowly that happens to be diversified and it's being open to deals and not just feeling like you have to just stick to one thing, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Well, I really, my takeaway was being open. If opportunity knocks, be ready to act. It doesn't mean you have to be like, I've got to act today. But if something comes up that presents itself. The other thing that you just mentioned was delayed gratification. And you talked about investing with your dad. So my question is, is that something that your parents helped nurture? Was that something you discovered on your own? Because many people don't experience delayed gratification. They feel like they're going to miss out. And so they're not looking at long-term or in the future. So I'm just curious about that mindset, where that came from. I think it'd probably be a mix of kind of three things. So it'd be um, my parents, you know, and their example of hard work, of living wisely with their money, of being more entrepreneurial, of kind of controlling your own destiny, along with sports. I learned at a young age, football, basketball, baseball, and then had the opportunity to play on scholarship basketball in, in college. And I fell in love with discipline and working as a team and just that putting yourself, I remember at football, you call them hell weeks, right? Where you're putting yourself at a, a very, in temperatures of 105 degrees here in Sacramento and just all the intensity of all that. You start to build character in maybe a, maybe a different way. And that really helped me. And then the last one would be my faith, you know, so just growing in my character beyond myself and not relying on myself, but trusting in Jesus and God to give me the power to, to do things the right way versus just the way that maybe I want to do them right. So those would be the three things that I contribute to that. It's so important from my perspective that being intentional and actually having a plan that you can execute or implement rather than just, hey, let's throw it out into the wind and see what happens. And so what I'm hearing is some real intentionality, some great modeling, and really like being intentional and not just, hey, let's see what happens. Have you had any situations where you look back and say, oh, financial regret? I mean, you were fortunate that the 208 happened while you didn't have a lot of money, but have there been a couple of those situations or a situation where 
I sort of missed the boat on that or things got a little bit a different outcome than I expected? Not really, honestly. I mean, most of the stuff that we've invested in has done well and there hasn't been anything that's really not least performed to some level of success, fortunately, right? And that's, again, I, part of that is the sponsors, part of that's diversifying, and part of that's not going all in by myself, right? I mean, we run the two podcasts, two businesses, I got five kids, and we're focused like a laser on the deferred sales trust, and we're doing a capital gains tax solution. So part of that is not, I guess here's one thing I did, I think did well, is I didn't try to be a multifamily syndicator operator as well as run capital gains tax solutions all at once. Like these are two separate businesses. Not that you can't do that, but I said, you know, I'm going to burn the ships and just focus like a laser on one thing and become the best at that. And then partner with others who are doing those things, right? At a high level versus just doing it by myself. So I don't necessarily attribute to me like just making great decisions on investments because that's not what I'm saying. It's more so not throwing all my money in at one thing, right? Or, or one property. So fortunately, it's been pretty good. I mean, of course, you could say, I wish I would have bought Ethereum or Bitcoin at a lower price, right? I would have bought more real estate in the, between 2009 and 2011. You look at those things like, yeah, had I done a little, I could have maybe bought a little bit more. But overall, you know, it's, it's been a pretty good run so far. And how do you figure out which partners you're going to trust? Like, are there any signs for you when you're looking for a professional, whether it's a CPA, whether it's an investment partner? What are things that you look for that might be an indicator that this is going to go well? Or is there something that you see and you say, it's no deal? Yeah, good question. First of all, I, ob I observe and I wait and I'm patient. So, you know, even for my clients, I'm not recommending or putting them in front of people that I don't either A, know, like, and trust and or B, have already personally invested with alongside of or have clients that instantly have millions of dollars with these other big groups. And so those are, that's kind of a, an initial foundation. Then the next one would be just be in integrity, right? You want to work with people that have a high level of integrity and track record. And there's a thing called, a book called The Ideal Team Player. And it's by Patrick Lencioni. And he talks about three concepts, humble, hungry, and smart. Are they humble and open to being wrong? Or are they humble and be open to criticism? Or do they know their strengths and they, and they also focus on that? Are they hungry? Like, are they they really passionate about what they do and why they're doing it, and who they're serving, right? And they're working harder perhaps than anybody else in the space. And then three, are they smart? And it's not necessarily the IQ, it's the EQ. Are they able to connect well with others? So I usually just, I'm pretty patient. I kind of observe, I try to be the tortoise versus the hare. And as I get to know somebody, as I see their actual deals, as I see their track record, I see their closings, I see the the results, then I'm more likely to say, yeah, I'd like to jump in with you. So it's a mix between watching, observing, and seeing a track record. That's great advice. I sometimes am so slow that I miss the deals because <laughs> I agonize and agonize. I probably sometimes overthink. And fortunately, I've had a good couple of partners that just sort of push me at the right time into a couple decisions of investments. Whereas if I would left my own devices, I probably would have missed the deadline. I would have just been late to the party. Now, I have a question. You've got five kids. Do they get everything they want? <laughs> <laughs> no chance. Yeah, no, that's, uh, we run a pretty tight ship. And uh, I mean, we were public school kids growing up. Now we homeschool our kids. So we're very intentional about their education and their journey and their faith journey and their athletic journey, educational journey, all that mixed together. So that's the beauty of, of having a, a rock star mom and, and a very dedicated dad and working as a team to make sure that they're not getting everything they want, but they're hopefully getting what they need. <laughs> Absolutely. Two different things. And probably what they need is more important than what they want. How do you talk with your kids about money? I'm curious because more and more, you know, sometimes I'll hear, wow, gosh, intentional parenting is, is so hard. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It is. But again, delayed gratification. You get to see your children grow and flourish knowing that you're actually putting in the time now to really give them the tools. How do you talk with your kids about money? You know, it's talking, but it's more so leading by example, right? We have the, we're very fortunate to be able to do what we do and how we do it. And they're, they're with us the majority of the time. And so, you know, my brother and I, we'd grow up with my parents, parents were divorced at a young age, but we'd spend time with my dad and the job site. And we'd wake up about 6 a.m. and be on the job site by about 6.37. And we'd work all the way until about 5.00. And we got to see the project from start to finish over the weeks and weeks and months and months of development of a project and, and absorb that type of entrepreneurial 
you know, have your own business, grow your wealth, cash flow, you know, rentals. And so we speak to them about those types of concepts of, hey, what if you could trade instead of trading time for dollars? What if dollars could give you time? Well, what if you could own real estate and enough real estate that you never have to work ever again and you can give to causes you believe in and you can travel whenever you want to? And one of my daughters is a is an artist and she loves to to um, create create artistic work and so and draw and, and all of these different things. And so we said, well, what if you didn't ever have to work for something you don't want to do? And so we try to instill that inspiration of of why it's important to learn about finances and money as well. We've we've been doing some Ethereum mining. And I like that because it's kind of a hobby, but it's also very practical and tangible. It's hands-on. We build these, we call them rigs, and they're expensive. And basically what they're doing is they're mining cryptocurrency, and in particular Ethereum. And so the kids can see, touch, and feel and say, and look at the app on dad's phone that shows the cash flow that came in this month and the cash flow that came in this month. And it's working 24-7. It's a 24-7 reminder of that is cash flow that we are just spending our day and it happens to be in the corner of the house and the other corner of the house building cash flow and wealth for the family. Now there's of course risk involved and they don't quite understand all, all of it. And neither do I as far as cryptocurrency, right? But it's real and it's happening and it's creating cash flow. And so we explain all of those things. So yeah, so it's a mix. And of course we read them books like the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. And we read them the Rich Parent, Smart Kid book. And and we just try to instill instill with them the financial uh, stuff that we wish we would have learned at a very young age. Absolutely. I think that's so wonderful that you're spending that time and teaching them and actually modeling it, which is probably much more impactful than just hearing it. 100%. Like anything, kids, their attention span is very short. They're interested in what they're interested in, right? You can try to sit down and teach them something. <laughs> One of the biggest misconceptions about homeschooling is people think it's like school from home where we're just sitting on a whiteboard teaching them stuff and it's like complete opposite. Some people might do that, but maybe the old school way. It's really about immersing them in something that they really love and then teaching them the concepts of education along those sides and helping them inspire them in whatever they're doing. And then of course, you got to get tangible on, on some stuff as well, very practical, but kids want to learn through observing and growing, being inspired, not by just a whiteboard or a PowerPoint presentation. Although some people that works for, but most kids, like my kids are very active. They're moving fast. Their brain and their questions and their where they're going is is 100 miles an hour. And so we're trying to create environments for them to learn on their own versus just telling them what to learn. You mentioned two things that, of course, always pique my interest. You talked about travel and charitable works, giving to causes. Why do you think, I'm just going to make an assumption here, that it is important giving back and doing charitable and giving to causes that are important to you. Why is that important to you? And the same about travel. Is that an important component of educating yourself or your kids? How do those two pieces impact your life? Yeah, so, I mean, giving to me is a way to know that and teach yourself and remind yourself that this world is so much bigger than just ourselves, right? And so if we have a chance to give back and make a difference in someone else's life, through our time, through our talents, through our, our wealth, it can make an impact for somebody else. And honestly, that's the most exciting part about life and marriage and kids and other things is being able to use the gifts and talents we've been given to be a blessing to others. I think there's a success formula or fulfillment formula that I've heard, and it goes something like this, the unique gift that we've been given. We've all been given maybe a couple gifts, strengths, superpowers. I think they're God-given gifts and they've been given to us. That's the first thing. Second thing would be, how do you maximize the potential of that gift? And this is part of also why we homeschool is because we want to hopefully identify the unique gifts, inspire those for our kids, and then help them develop the maximum potential of those gifts. And let's lead into the third component, which is then how do we use those gifts to make an impact for others? And we kind of take that all encompassing that by there's a reason that we're here bigger than ourselves, we believe, right? It's God. It's the mission he's given us to do with these gifts, to be a blessing to others. All of that together equals fulfillment, right? And so if at any one point we're not using those gifts, we're not maximizing the potential of these gifts, we're not making a bigger impact on other people, we're not thinking there's a higher purpose for this, we're not just here by accident, then that part of that fulfillment or the success formula is going to be missing. Something's going to be off. And so giving and developing these gifts and doing these things is foundational to life, to fulfillment, to success. And so that's the giving part as well. You know, I believe in the Bible, so... We want to give a percentage um, of our wealth to causes and, and above and beyond that too, when opportunities arise, that's also a part of that. 
The next part as far as travel, yeah, I think travel is great because it opens up again this idea that is not just about us in this small town in Northern California. It's a big world out there with a lot of needs, a lot of challenges, a lot of inspiration, a lot to learn from. And as you immerse yourself in different cultures and different places of the world and different ideas, it can also inspire you to go make a big difference and get back more on your next part of your journey. What do you want your legacy to be? I think you have to break that down into kind of a couple of different places. So first of all, for my family, right, that that would be my opportunity to change the family tree. So I mentioned that in the beginning, the family, growing up, parents married, everything's going great. Big money, Silicon Valley, east of the Bay Area, houses, Corvettes, Harleys, boats, really cool. Parents got divorced and it went from like tons of wealth to being with my mom most of the time and like no wealth. I mean, like zero. And so I got to see both sides of the life and worldviews and beliefs and then the destruction that can cause when you're living certain ways. And so that destruction, I wanted to change the family tree for my family, for my dedication to my wife, my kids, and living in a way that forever changes the family tree, right? So that, I think that would be the first thing with my family. As far as business, you know, I want to make the, a difference in the lives of people who feel trapped either in their wealth and their exiting of their wealth and or as a business professional who wants to help people in a way that's transformational, that's bigger than just the traditional ways of doing things, right? I've always been pretty entrepreneurial, think outside the box, challenge the norm. And I want to empower people with that strategy because I was once in their shoes, barely making it, working the side job hustle at Cheesecake Factory, 70 hour weeks, basketball tournaments. People tell me, go quit Marcus and Millichap, you know, stop working in real estate. It's going to be so hard, but I believed in that. And then that tool helped me to change the trajectory of my career. And now I'm on this side of success, but it's like not with all of the heartache. So I want to try to help them speed up that process, but also know that they too can find something that they can connect with and help other people. The last one would be just be my faith. I want to make sure that at the end of my life, I have no regrets in regards to following Jesus, following my Christian beliefs, knowing that I was all in and committed to what I believe God had for my life and for my family and for my business. I appreciate you sharing that. I feel like your legacy has already been set. You're doing the work. And I think for me, what's also important is sharing this place where you've had the experience of not having it all or having it all and then not having it so that that's a place where it can be relatable. I think sometimes people, as they get into their new wealth, they have a story that everybody else already had it, that nobody can understand what it's like to struggle. And it sounds like you've experienced both worlds, which makes it a lot more relatable because a lot of the stuff is highbrow stuff. When you start talking, you know, deferring capital gains and high net worth for some people, you know, you even talked about this, like some people, they have all this wealth, but they still have all this fear or they still don't know how to do the exit strategy or they just don't know. And they're embarrassed to ask maybe. And you come in and provide a service that actually is relational, that helps people to actually get maximum value out of their finances and out of hopefully out of their life and their legacy. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing every day, trying to achieve too and trying to make better every day for everyone who's uh, connected with us and the chances we get an opportunity to serve them. That's great. We are at Fast Five, Brett. Fast Five brought to you by Acorns, which is where you can invest, spare change, bank smarter, save for retirement, and much more. For more information, you can check out the episode show notes. Brett, what financial mistake do you wish you could go back and undo? Besides cryptocurrency, maybe. <laughs> yeah, not buying it earlier, right? Yeah, so, I mean, we did the Dave Ramsey plan, right? We did that for 26 months. So we paid off all of our debt, like $60,000. And we established that when we first got married. We're so glad we did that. It's not so much a mistake as it, I wish I would have just bought more real estate or bought more crypto, right? Bought when I just find a way to buy more, or partner with more people, right? I think in the beginning, I tried to do it on my own and then figured out that I can do it with partners and just get started early on that investment purchase of real estate or cryptocurrency. Do you think money more often solves problems or causes problems? You know, money, I think, definitely reveals some of the character flaws that we have or some of the habits that we should update or change or modify. So in the right hands with the right people, the right time, with the right amount of freedom, flexibility can change the world, right? I think it's entrepreneurs and, and folks that have money with our families and our wealth, we have an opportunity to give to the causes we believe in most. That makes sense for each individual family. And that is the power of money. 
But if it's in those who maybe haven't earned it or aren't held accountable to it and or who take it for granted and are, aren't being good stewards with it, then it could be a huge lot of problems. So, yeah. So I guess the answer is both. Just depends on the integrity of the person. Yeah, absolutely. Of everything you've done in your life, what's the one thing that you are the most proud of that you've done for yourself? Man, I just got to say choosing or being blessed with the love of my life, Melanie, and then subsequently the five children we've had. So, I mean, they're my pride and joy, the reason I'm working so hard. And uh, so I'd say my, uh, my wife, my children. Yeah, that's great. Can you describe your relationship with money in three words? Mm. My relationship with money, committed, focused, and generous. Love it. Love it. Many people feel that money is stressful. When was the last time you felt excited about your finances? I'm going to say probably all the time. <laughs> You know, it, with five kids, I'd say it, it's ever changing, right? Like people go, how do you have five kids? I'm like, I don't know. I'll tell you when, when they're all 18 and still alive and going well, right? <laughs> like, it's like, they're expensive, right? I mean, what was it? They're ICUs, they're income consuming units, right? And so our youngest is three, our oldest is 11. And we're doing jujitsu, we're doing soccer. You know, we've got extracurricular activities. We've got, we got travel. I mean, flying on planes, they're really expensive. Going to Disney World. I mean, there's certain things you're just like, hey, these kids are expensive. So it's stressful just to keep the budget in line and organized because it's ever moving. Like it's, it's so simple when, you know, I had a W-2 job in the back. It's like, I make X, they take out tax. I live on Y, I'm single, like easy, like boom, I can give this much. Like, da, 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 da. And then you be an entrepreneur and your income's growing and things are going and, and, and income's coming from investments. And then you have kids that are growing. So it's just like this, a Rubik's cube again, right? Where you're trying to get this whole thing all organized. And so I just say the that's, that can be stressful. I'm very detailed and I'm very structure oriented. And when there's all these moving parts, sometimes it's hard to get that structure back under balance. So that is stressful. So I'd have to just say, I mean, we're not clear on our budget. When my wife and I are not clear on our budget, that's stressful. Yeah, absolutely. And budgets are important, at least from my perspective. We're at the M&M portion of the show, the money and motivation. Is there a financial tip or a piece of wealth wisdom you could share with the listeners, you know, you talked about budgeting and stuff. What's something that you find is really useful? Yeah, it's a quote by Jim Rohn, R-O-H-N. And it states, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. If you work harder on your job, you'll make a living. If you work harder on yourself, you'll make a fortune. And the idea is not just about money, although that's really cool because you can earn a lot so you can support your family and give to the causes you believe in and have financial freedom and all those really neat things. The idea is to become more of who we were created to be and to grow in those qualities of our character and our integrity and our leadership and our health and our finances and our wealth and all of the other things that are our faith that are so important in life. And when we become more, then we have an opportunity to earn and give more. And that's, so that's the idea. So instead of focusing on the outcome of what you want, focus on external, focus on the internal of who you want to become and work harder on that then you do anything else. And so I wish I would have known that concept in high school. And they just talked about getting, just get the A's and the B's past the SAT, da, 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 you know, get the team captain, be the starter on the team. All those things are the, the things that the world's going to tell you. And then you go to college, get the degree, and then you go to work and get the promotion. And then you get, you know, close the commission deal and then make this amount of money. Those are all external. And those external things are just temporary. But what's lasting is the eternal qualities of your character and the decisions we make. And so that would be the thing I would say about money. And then money is going to be attracted to those who are solving problems and using their gifts at the highest level. And that's the key. So you, you don't start with trying to get, you start with trying to become. That is very well said. You know, Brett, like what I've really appreciated about this conversation is, and I, maybe I had a little bias going into this, but, or perception is that it's really not about how do we make lots and lots of money? It's really about how do we live in our abundance? intentionally. Like I really hear this piece about intentionality, delayed gratification, being the tortoise versus the hare, taking it at the pace that's right and being able to connect with your faith, being able to connect with paying it forward, giving to others. And this piece about building internally, it just feels so important because a lot of that external stuff is just temporary. It feels like our whole world depends on making some of these marks. And at the end of the day, our legacy is our integrity. It's what we leave behind for who we are, not for what we've accomplished in terms of finances. 
Yeah, you got it. But it's also great to make a lot of money too, so you can <laughs> give and, and bless others too, right? It's a good scorecard, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's both, right? So it, Absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with making lots of money. I just love that the dial has shifted more on being of service and abundance and having that financial freedom versus I got to make more money than everybody else and try and take everybody out. And I'm not hearing that at all. I'm hearing about team building and teams. And for me, that's just an inspiring model for people to... Thanks, Paul. Yeah, appreciate it. Where can people find you on social media and on the internet, online? Yep, go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. You can also search YouTube and our Facebook as well as Instagram and also LinkedIn. And of course, our website, YouTube. Yeah, those are all the ones, capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. And if you're a business professional and you're looking to level up, you can go to experttaxsecrets.com as well. And then I'll also mention too, we're coming out with a, a brand new book and it's called Building a Tax Deferred Exit Strategy, the proven playbook for unlocking your ideal wealth plan when selling assets of any kind for yourself or your clients. And we have some cool people in here like Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank. He's uh, chapter one, which is awesome. He agreed to be in the book and a number of other really smart people in multifamily investing, financial advising, as well as uh, I have a, a chapter or two in there as well about the Deferred Sales Trust. Well, awesome. We'll be sure and put that up on the website and in the show notes. And you also have a podcast. If you could just say that podcast name again, that'd be great. Capital Gains Tax Solutions is the podcast. Yep, you can search that on, on iTunes. Yep. Awesome, awesome. Well, I so appreciate having this conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing. And I wish you well. Thank you, Bob. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Did you learn something new about your relationship to money today? Maybe you have a friend who has some financial blocks or beliefs that are holding them back. Please share this podcast so they too can get off the roller coaster ride of financial fears and journey towards financial freedom. To learn how to have a healthy relationship with money, visit themoneynerve.com. That's nerve, not nerd. We'll be back next week with another perspective on money and the emotions that bind us. Oh,